I believe it is recording to the cloud. It's recording to the cloud. Well done. And it is 7.57, so I'm gonna just ask if uh, anybody recognizes this building. The one that's in the background of the slide? Correct. Uh, it's either Paul Rudolph or Le Corbusier. <laughs> that's <Close>. really <laughs> Oh, it could be it could be Salk Institute. It is. We're In good. Well done. And there's a uh, blackboard. In fact, I believe there's a blackboard in almost every bay of the laboratory entrances. But I was captivated by this illustration. Uh, we've all we're all familiar with the term affordances, right? That uh, yeah. And so, AJ Gibson. Yeah. And so Louis Kahn apparently felt it was an appropriate affordance to allow the scientists to uh, either compute or communicate their work on a blackboard in a public area. And this was rather well done. And it shows various implications that apparently are connected to uh the genesis of cancerous uh growth and i've been looking up the various words on there and it's not like i understand really what all these things are but the the reference to stress was of interest to me it's oxidative stress and we're going to be talking more about stress so that's good <coughs> also uh we have immune surveillance and our immune system, of course, is uh, a very important dimension of our physiology and lipogenesis, which is essentially the manufacturing of fat cells. I'm and very good at that, by, by the way. <laughs> and we My have in inflammation and inflammation is directly related to stress, right? I mean, yeah. it is. It is Definitely. a pure physiological indicator of stress. Still 7.59, so I'm still rambling, but I, I wanna spend a minute on this quote, which uh, speaks to me. It says, a new discipline, planetary health is emerging that focuses on the increasingly visible connections between the well being of humans, other living things, and entire ecosystems. And I think that's as good a description as any of the elephant in the room. And I have this image of each of the contributors to this volume as being like the, uh, the blind folks in the Indian folktale of, you know, uh, touching an elephant on different parts of their anatomy and coming up with different explanations of what it was. And in essence, our chapters are like that. We're coming at the same topic from many different perspectives. And uh, it's now officially eight o'clock. Uh, welcome everybody who's on and continue to ramble a little bit on the next slide as others join us. I want to... Uh, start by saying that this was uh, a magnificent group effort involving probably 30 separate authors and editors. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank Pamela de Oliver Smith, whom I hope is on. Pam, you wanna say hi, Pamela? Maybe not yet. And Keely, who I know is on, just say yeah. hello. And we'll be seeing more of Keeley in a moment. Both of them took our raw material and formed it into a coherent volume with an index, acronyms, and uh, an excellent uh, summary of the terminology uh, of the highlighted words. And I do think that it came out as a seamless final product 
made from many different pieces of cloth. So thank you both. And we'll hopefully get to acknowledge Pamela when she arrives shortly. I'm gonna say just a few words about the introduction, which is on the next slide. And what we're looking at here is a picture of the human body and its various parts. Uh, Bill Reed, one of our authors likes to say that you can, you can take a part of body and, and look at the individual pieces and not get to know the person. It's how they function together as a whole and with uh, the functioning of all the systems in relationship to their surroundings and their past that we actually get a, uh, a being that we can know and relate to. We are interested in monitoring how that being does that work of relating and that has been the subject of psychology and to a certain extent, ecology. And this volume intends to take that into the realm of the design professions by promoting evidence-based design. Evidence-based design or evidence-based practice is a medical term that uh, you intend to promote specific outcomes. You state those outcomes and then you monitor the process and the outcomes to determine if you achieve them as intended. This has not been central to the design professions and uh, we think it can be and should be. So programming is the process of establishing the goals and then the post-occupancy evaluation determines the outcomes. We're, we're, this volume is mostly about that programming stage but it's incomplete without the final determination. And then our biology is hardwired and requires specific stimuli for health. I think that is well known to the medical community, but not well understood by the design professions. Well, we are the product of evolution. And although we have achieved great things in the last several millennia, our basic physiology is much older and uh, respecting that is essential to our ongoing health. We will hear more about stress, but uh, essentially the systems-based approach to design and to human perception is based on the continued health of ongoing systems with sufficient resilience to overcome stress. If the stress is too great, the resilience is diminished and it results in dysregulation, which is just another way of saying ill health. So with that, we're gonna jump right into the middle of the book with a discussion of the methods for monitoring our innate, you could say unconscious, or uh, mammalian self. And I'll turn this over to Anne, who has uh, several co-authors on board as well. Well, well, thank you. Um, very great introduction, Vernon. And um, I'd like to welcome Justin Hollander and Mengfei Wang, my collaborators. And I'm gonna stop the share and share with a, um, and share our screen right now. I'll just do that really quickly. And um, I think you should be able to see this. Can you all see this now? Yep, yep. You got it? Justin, did you want to take it away? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Anne. Um, so thank you, Vernon and uh, Keely and Pam. Really an uh, honor to be part of this book launch and the book. Um, so, so this is a chapter that is a result of a collaboration across four different institutions. So I teach at Tufts University, um, but we also did this project through the Human Architecture and Planning Institute, as well as the Boston Architectural College, and then our colleagues in Europe at the Amsterdam U University of Sciences. And um, 
really in many ways, this was a comparative study between Amsterdam and Boston. Um, and so um, I don't think our colleagues from Amsterdam are, are able to join us this evening. It's 2.30 in the morning uh, over there. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, so what we're gonna, we're gonna try to just uh, give you like a sense of some of the things that we, that we worked on in this research and that we, that we wrote about in the chapter. So let's just start with a video. Um, what you're seeing here um, on the left is a research subject who were recording their eye movements with uh, two cameras. And you can see as they, their eyes stretch across the, um, the image, wherever they focus, there, it, it enlarges and the size of that, that circle is, is the size of the focus. So this is um, an extraordinary insight into the, what this person's automatically responding to when they see an image of a building. Let me go to that next slide. Sorry about that. Yeah. <clears throat> and so if you do that with one person, that's really fascinating. But if you do it with 30 or 40 people, you start to get these patterns that emerge through what you're seeing here is a heat map. The, um, the red is the, the darkest, is the most intense places that people are looking at. And what, you're, what you see right away is that people are, are looking at the statues. <laughs> I mean, these people like to look at other people. And, and, and that's really what we're trying to get at in this chapter, that we are evolved mammals. And at our core, we are looking to connect with other people. We are looking to look for certain shapes and certain, certain patterns. And to the extent that that can be part of programming and architecture, man, I mean, that's a game changer. Yeah. Be able to draw on this kind of uh, biometric insights to, to really change the way we approach the design of buildings. I don't know, demo. So in this research and other projects um, that Anne and I have collaborated and others have, um, we, we use a, a laboratory which draws on that kind of eye tracking that, that I just showed you. Um, but as, as you see on the right, there's, there's other ways that you can capture people's unconscious reactions to buildings yeah. and, and urban forms. Car companies use this. Uh, this company that we're, 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 we've been working with quite a lot uh, iMotions, they, their clients are Honda, BMW, GM. So the car companies are paying attention to people's unconscious reactions, to paying attention to their bio biology and their, their biological reactions to places. So architects really need to do the same thing. And, and that's, that's really what we're trying to argue you know, in our research. The, I mean, the, Sigmund Freud said it best, the mind is like an iceberg. It floats with one seventh of its bulk above water. So we are really mainly experiencing the world around us unconsciously. Yeah. And so our conscious experience is, is very minor. So if, if all you're doing is you're asking the client, um, oh, so what design yeah. do you want? Do you want to pick your small or little yeah, I mean, colors I, or your favorite colors? You're only going to get certain types pardon of Pardon me. But, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Justin. Could everybody mute, please? There's a, some background chatter going on. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> um, so, so, so I, that's, that's the kind of framing for the project and I wanna turn it over to Anna. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was really well said, Justin. I mean, it's a famous quote, uh, Freud never got to use these biometric research that we have today and he's absolutely right. You're uncomfortable <laughs> describing your experience much more than you realize. <clears throat> and no, and okay, that's what we like, all, th th could, could you mute, mute please? Because we're hearing someone else talking. <laughs> so um, I, I guess I don't. Like, you know, man, as host, you can do it. I just feel like everything you're feeling seems valid to me. And um, that last thing you said about is. like wanting to ask. Uh, uh, Vernon, you can mute all. Hannah doesn't seem off base to me. Who's ever, who's ever in charge of this uh, Zoom, you can mute everybody. I don't know what that would look and then like. Unmute Anne. But it does seem like. She's really like putting you in the yeah. category of like you can do it. Yeah, I can do it. Oh, okay. other, uh, like, I, I don't know quite how to do it. Values um, and better judgment apply or something. You can hover over the box and um, click on it and it'll give you the option to mute. 
it's not, it's not there's, a little, uh, there's a triangle me. in um next yeah. to the food. i think that you can do that with that i'm not too sure though it's not letting me do it it's not allowing me to do it oh, okay okay anyways so what we'll talk about now is um the opportunity you do mobile eye tracking down two different streets in boston which was absolutely fantastic and um we'll go to Meng Fei. Um, these are the two streets we did, Newbury Street and Boston. Streets where people have, you know, a very different experiences yeah. and yet we've never biologically shown how. And in this pilot study, we wanted to reveal that. Um, and so what we'll show you here, do you want to start talking about this, Meng Fei? Okay. So this video was taken yeah. when a respondent walking through Newbury Street so you can see from the yellow circle and the uh, polylines where the respondents was looking at. So we can, yeah. The fixations were on the uh, facades, the lower facades of the buildings, and also it's uh, also focused on people and cars on the road. Yeah. And so what you can do, because you get so much data when you do this, it can get a little confusing. So what it's good to do is to aggregate things into 10 second gaze paths. So here what we did is um, we aggregated the data over 10 seconds of how someone looked that, as they walked down the street without realizing it. Um, that's what really fascinated us, how even having a car not moving on the street um, got people to focus, well, fixate on it about 10 times. Mm -hmm. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Any other comments about this, Menfei? Yeah, so if you look at uh, this image and the, follow the following images, you may notice that people will focus more on the car and also yeah. other groups of people. And a moving car really grabs your attention. So yeah. when you start to see this is what this technology reveals. It's kind yeah. of I think that's great. I, mean, I think it, like it really reveals our animal. I would also. I'm sorry, but can you guys call out I feel whoever like, VH is to tell her to mute? I feel like when stuff, I mean, just so much of this is like VH not going well so in your life right out. now that yeah. I feel like I, 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 I think I that it's really VH. good to like have those like and can you go to participants like and you'll see next to the age of mute buttons. You so all. As... Okay. I've muted all. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Okay. And so what's, what's fascinating here is how you can actually see, it's kind of ironic that what you're seeing is um, our animal nature. We're using this most sophisticated technology, and what is it showing us? We're really animals, much more than we realize. We're seeing cars as large animals. We immediately, our brain immediately focuses, you see all the fixations here on people walking towards us. It was absolutely amazing. Um, now let me see if I can find Meng Fei here and unmute Meng Fei. You can unmute Meng Fei. Uh, Meng Fei can yeah. unmute herself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can unmute myself. Uh, so let's let me talk about the heat maps. So these are a few of heat maps we generated when a respondent standing on the Boylston Street, and we can from the heat, uh, we can see from the heat maps that the respondents looking more on the roads, especially the end of the road, and also looking at the lower stories of a building. They never uh, they seldom raise up their head to look at the tall buildings. Uh, we can go, yeah, this is another image and we can see the similar results for another respondent. And this is the eye tracking video we used to generate the heat maps we showed before. So this is a respondent standing on a spot on Newberry Street and looking around. And we can see the fixations of the respondents I mostly uh, focus on the lower stories of building. And these are two images of the same thing. And we can see the heat maps on the, um, on the images below and pe uh, people, uh, respondents focus on the, the road. And we can see the clearly the edge of the road. And also it's a kind of um, 
phenomenon that we, our eyes like to detect edges. Right, and what's fascinating about us for us too is just how much attention even parked cars get. So someone like Walt Disney was a brilliant designer. He realized in designing Disneyland Main Street in the 1950s, he had to make it car free. Once you put a car on a road, even parked, it stresses you because there's a lot of visual energy that to be able to process that. You see how much the red, the red dots focus down the road? Without cars on that street, people, their bodies and brains would have a different experience. It's really interesting you start to see this with this kind of technology. We'll talk briefly about galvanic skin response. If you want to, we can talk just, this gets a little more complicated. It measures nervous system nice. arousal. Mm -hmm. On your own, let's go ahead. So you can see at the, the peak chart, the bar chart below, and you can start seeing how your autonomic nervous system immediately charges back and forth as all this flowing. Oops, you see a person, look, a person just got in your view suddenly and you see the little peak, you see the little peak below? It's absolutely amazing. This technology is really, really powerful at showing how your body is instantly responding to stimuli. So you can see why the car companies, companies like Procter and Gamble are using it in everything they design because they want to control you. <laughs> Relax. And, mm -hmm. and then where we really saw people's nervous system really peak is when they were touched. If you look at the bar chart at the very bottom at the far right, the um, neuroscientist helping us run this study then removed the galvanic skin responses, the sensors. And wow, the woman's nervous system just peaked like mad at the idea of being touched. It was quite interesting to watch that. Okay, and we did do surveys, asking opinions. Do you want to say briefly about this, Mengfei? Uh, so from the survey, we get the result that respondents all enjoy the new virus rate the most. And we could kind of draw conclusions as to why that in a way the Newbury Street, it, we, it had lower um, GSR arousal. It was calmer for the nervous system. Then that translated to the body to having um, a better experience. It's really interesting. You could start to connect what people physically say with what their biological data is. And it's quite fascinating. We learned that external environments instantly impact us and different ones impact us differently. And we can start to design now to get the, to get the best results. We need to really take this into account. We can't avo avoid or ignore our biology. Um, I'm doing a lecture, you wanna listen? What is it? I'm not sure who's talking now. <laughs> But um, I'll just say when we do present this um, for, for learning units, for architectural conference, we explain about the human face bias, how it's hardwired into our brain, and how this impacts everything we relate to. We grasp the potential of eye tracking to better understand the human experience of the built environment and gain familiarity with other tools like galvanic spin response and how it works to track internal emo emotional arousal states, including stress. And finally, we understand how human perception is relational meant for one-to-one -one interaction and why this matters for sustainable development, influencing well-being overall. Um, I'd like to thank you for this and for giving this opportunity to present to you as well as the opportunity the researchers in Holland gave us to run this study. It really has been fantastic. Thank you for um, the Amsterdam University for funding this study. It couldn't have happened without you. And I will stop share. And um, I think what we'll do now is start share again with um, our next our next speakers, which I believe are Laura and Davis. Hello everybody. I um, have some uh, slides here and if you'll let me have share, I will start at the beginning. Sounds fine, you stop share, you're on your way. I am Davis Hart, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all and great to be in a book with you all and, and imagine ourselves around a, around a, a conference table someday um, speaking in person. But for today, uh, briefly, Laura Regret and I will introduce ourselves and uh, give you a brief overview of chapter one. And Laura? Hello. Yeah, my name is Laura Regret. I am... Um... Really happy to be here as well, working with Davis on this chapter and been working with Ann and Davis both on a lot of these ideas over the last year and a half. So it's great to be here, thank you. 
Our task was to um, broach a very large topic of interior environments, uh, focused specifically on the human experience, health, and well being. Um, serving as the director for the Design for Human Health Master's program at the Boston Architectural College, I found this to be right up my alley. Um, so, our idea of how to share in a few moments with you all and kind of pique your interest was to give you just one big visual image here, which is the Venn diagram, it's a theoretical framework of the Design for Human Health program. Also just all of us moving about in the world as people interested in space and place and how the design would be overlapping with culture, psychology and physical, biological, uh, neuroscientific elements. Uh, so here is our list of our sections in our chapter. We have design meets science, uh, as Vern talked about at the beginning. What is evidence-based design? Um, I teach a class on environmental psychology and interior design. Uh, that's the third subsection. Then of course, we wanted to make sure everybody has a common foundation of stages of design. So programming for health and well-being. Uh, the design related hypotheses and theories, as well as concepts that we feel inform programming is the next section. And followed by getting a little more specific now, getting into the neuroaesthetics and neuroarchitecture of the brain and environment, followed by design for health and well being, the framework to understand stimulus response as we are uh, in these physical bodies experiencing the world through stimulation. Uh, from there, a brief look at color as far as our biology and perception go, and ends with the section on salutogenic design, which uh, briefly is sort of a, a other side of the coin of pathogenic design. So we're not moving towards disease, we're moving towards health and well-being, as well as nature and biophilia. And uh, I'll turn it over to Laura for our last slide. Chapter one. Thank you, Davis. Yeah, I, I just wanted to focus on kind of one piece of this. As an, I'm an interior designer, I teach at the BAC, I teach design studio, and I've been working with Davis and Anne trying to figure out how to integrate evidence based design and, in particular, design for health and well being into my studio work. And so this chapter really helped. And, you know, I love looking at these theories. So just starting with these basic theories in the chapter allows designers a way to explain to their clients that, you know, kind of the secret is a lot of what we do, like we already do this, but now we know that the reason we do it is that there's science behind it. And um, the more we know the science, the more we can do it better. And so those first three theories are kind of basic theories. And then th those lead to much more complicated theories, um, which are really interesting to, ex you know, to figure out how to give people control of their environment, how to stimulate them in the proper ways to put on the environment, how to integrate everything we know about design into our design um, ba and base it, you know, on health and well-being, and then looking at pattern mapping and behavior setting. So that's just those are really interesting theories. They build on the ones before that, and all of this helps designers create um, a more empathetic space that that really is based on health and well-being. And that is so out there right now in the ethos. Everyone's talking about it. So uh, this is very timely. This book is very timely and. Just, you know, the whole chapter is great. And, but it just really leads to, makes you want to go um, look things up and do more research. And that was our goal. Thank you. Thank you all. Hello. That's a wrap from us, Anne, so we'll never know. That's, that's, are you done? Yes. Oh my gosh, that was so quick. <laughs> okay, let me share my screen with the next person. Um, that sounds fantastic. Yes, Anne, can you hear me okay? Yes. So biophilia is a theme that runs through the book. Obviously, uh, Laura just mentioned it's but it's, it's the most documented intervention for improving health and well-being uh, of any that I think we suggest. 
So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, the folks at Terrapin Bright Green have been essential in getting this information out and showing the economic benefits of including nature in your designs, both exterior and interior. And uh, for environmental reasons, obviously, as well as human, uh, it's, it's going to be the future of the design profession to design with nature, to design in accordance with nature, and uh, Bill Reed will be talking more about that shortly. Don, you're up. Okay, let's see. Share screen. How's that? So good? Excellent. Okay. Well, I want to publicly thank uh, Vernon for all the amazing work that you've done on this project. And then uh, also thank Keely and Pamela for all their amazing work. And they weren't, you know, too rough on me in the uh, editing phase. Uh, so I'm grateful for all your kindness as well as your leadership. So it's really special to work with this group of people. So, so following from my chapter, which is dealing with the notion of beauty in architecture and design, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that I didn't uh, write too much about in the chapter, and that's the place that stress is playing in uh, society currently. Um, and as it is reflected by our drive to achieve health and well-being. And I'll start this brief presentation by asking two questions. And the first question has two components. And is why is there so much emphasis today on achieving health and well-being? And then how does beauty happen to factor into that? So that's the first question. And then the second question um, is, how is society being supported uh, in the drive to achieve health and well-being. Well, this slide it gives us some clue about that. So books, magazines, podcasts, seminars, life coaches, psychologists, doctors, biologists, neuroscientists. It seems everywhere we turn, um, there's a new emphasis on how can we achieve balance and health and well-being in our lives. And I just go to the local bookstore and look at the magazine articles and what, what the features are. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing how a society is seeking this out and looking for new ways to achieve balance and health and well being. Well, given some recent advances in science, there's yet another group beyond this short listing here on the screen another group of professionals that are poised to become important players in the health and well-being movement. And that's because of a confluence of scientific ideas that's currently happening and it's happening worldwide. And those, those professionals are architects and designers. So, you know, as architects and designers, we now have a a possible position of responsibility unlike any we've ever had before um, and helping to lead the health and well-being movement and per this quote on the screen architects and designers have a greater ability to improve public health and medical professionals this is a profound sea change um, in our profession and it's you know it's coming to fruition because of work by many of the authors that are included in this book. So health, health and well-being is achieved in part by enjoying the notion of beauty. Beauty is an intuitive emotional response that implies inspiration and wonderment and awe and curiosity at its most fundamental and at its most elemental phase most fundamental and elemental phase, beauty is a sense of pleasure. Yet this phrase has all but disappeared from the world of art and architecture. In fact, it's 
we think, seen as a romantic notion from a bygone era. But in fact, it's actually quite important to achieving health and well being. I started to notice something about this way back in the 1970s when we started to notice that our projects were generating two different responses. There was the occasional, your project is beautiful. And then the more random quote, your project's really interesting and exciting. And those seemed like two diametrically opposed reactions. So we started to look into it and it led us to neuroscience. And it turns out that exciting and beautiful are two terms um, that are feelings and they're associated with subliminal emotions. And these two feelings um, are, again, related to the emotions of life. These are the two critical emotions of life, survival and pleasure. At the most fundamental level, humankind is genetically predisposed to seek these two things, survival and pleasure. Every day, our bodies process billions of actions with us having no awareness of it whatsoever. An amazing 95% of all actions are processed by our brain, our intuitive and subconscious, and all are geared to these two emotions, survival and pleasure. Well, here are two quick examples. Here's an architectural image that contains both emotions, exciting and survival geometric patterns combined with a beautiful geometric pattern. So the, the beautiful pattern, of course, is the historic building and then the survival um, pattern, the exciting and survival pattern is the new structure above. And I just notice how your, your brain is struggling probably to understand and comprehend the geometry of these two opposing systems. Well, here's an image that contains, again, both survival pattern and pleasure pattern as well. So normally a table full of food and wine and cheese in a meadow adjacent to a body of water would be a strong pleasure pattern. Yet the lightning has turned this into a survival pattern that dominates the pleasure pattern. So the purpose of showing this slide is to show how the survival pattern overwhelms the pleasure pattern. Neuroscientists think that the survival emotion actually is five to seven times stronger than a pleasure emotion. And that's because our brains evolved to protect us first and then seek pleasure later. So that brings me to another quick concept. We've been discussing subconscious processing and the brain has to have inputs to process and because the discussion is dealing with subconscious processing, then it's the autonomic nervous system that I'm dealing with here. And the autonomic nervous system is made up of two very important and inseparable streams of information that you've no doubt uh, heard about before, sympathetic and parasympathetic inputs. And these directly affect our health and well-being. Well, sympathetic inputs are considered survival inputs and conversely, parasympathetic are considered beautiful and pleasure inputs. Well, there's some really important health benefits that um, are assigned to these two streams of information. So sympathetic is known as uh, a stress and survival reaction and most commonly is known as fight, flight or freeze reaction. And the major characteristics of a sympathetic event, which is a stress event, are adrenaline and also cortisol. And the event initiates elevated heart rate, elevated blood pressure, uh, activates your, deactivates your immune system and narrows your mental focus. All of this is to prepare you to protect yourself. Well, conversely, parasympathetic inputs are stress relieving. It lowers your heart rate, lowers your blood pressure, improves your cardiovascular system, improves your immune system, and broadens your mental focus, all of which leads to improved health and well being. So, parasympathetic inputs not only make us feel good, they boost the general state and sense 
of our health. So the core message here that I'm trying to deliver is that our subconscious brain is making decisions for us all day, every day, based on survival or pleasure inputs. And there are significant health benefits that we encounter, both positive and negative. Well, this information led us to biology and psychology. A healthy nervous system achieves balance when the flow of sympathetic and parasympathetic inputs are in balance. And that balance is known as homeostasis. In a life that's all stress and sympathetic, we know, of course, is not good for us. So likewise, a life that's all pleasure and parasympathetic is equally damaging to us. So it's important that we have both parasympathetic and sympathetic components to our life. Again, that's known as homeostasis. Well, this diagram is showing the importance of that balance between the two um, streams of information. Well, here's a diagram that shows where much of our architecture is resting today with a strong, strong emphasis on sympathetic and exciting inputs with a de-emphasis on parasympathetic and beautiful inputs. Clearly, you know, th this is a situation that we should try to avoid with too much emphasis on, paras on sympathetic inputs because of the negative health components. So I'll go back to the questions that I started the talk with. Today, stress is at an all-time high in society, and some medical professionals estimate that up to 80% of visits to a physician have a stress component. It seems that like we are uh, dealing with stress 24-7, and the instinctual counterbalance to stress individuals are desperately seeking to rebalance their lives to achieve health and well-being and ultimately homeostasis. And this in turn has resulted in a broad emphasis on health and well-being throughout the sciences and media and now the design professions. So th this is the general message of the book is that we're looking for ways to rebalance the design process so that we can achieve health and well-being and homeostasis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. That was great. That was wonderful presentation. And now we'll go to the next, um, our next speaker. Keely. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Keely Menezes. Um, in addition to my chapter, I had the privilege of serving as co-editor for the project, which I'm so appreciative of the opportunity. Um, thank you to Justin, Ann, and Vernon for getting me here and lifting me up. And um, thank you also to everyone who took the time to write in addition to all the design and academic work that they do on a daily basis. I hope that my emails weren't too pesky. Um, so my chapter is entitled Programming for People. It starts off the buildings section of the book that deals with interactions between people and their environments on the individual level. So in my mind, this begins with bodies and it begins with realistic understandings of what the average person is cognizant and capable of. Um, a quarter of the American population is disabled and any number of people on a day-to-day -day basis are dealing with something, maybe illness, injury, grief, marginalization, um, that impacts the way that they move through their physical environment. So the chapter does two things. Um, first, it challenges the designer to sort of free their quote unquote normal user from um, assumptions of able-bodiedness, um, slenderness, atheism, sobriety, literacy. Um, I, in the chapter, I borrow this idea of the tax from Susan Stryker, um, who is a scholar of gender studies who identifies as trans. And even though she transitioned decades ago, she still finds herself looking over her shoulder when she's in sex segregated spaces, um, feeling a lot of nervousness, stress, anxiety, um, all these ideas that we've talked about 
um, that are really contribute to accumulated um, distress that causes disease and um, a lack of wellness. And this added stress she calls the tax. It's part of the um, the payment that trans people pay just for existing in the world. Um, and all kinds of people that for whatever reason don't quite into, fit into like average or the normal user, quote unquote, uh, pay taxes in the form of environmental stress and programming to accommodate a wider range of human experiences is programming for wellness. So the second thing that the chapter does is argue that by doing this, um, you can go back, I won't use these um, images, um, is it doesn't just benefit folks on the margins of the spectrum um, of experience, but it benefits all of us. So it uses, the chapter uses this idea of the curb cut effect to discuss how broadening access for some facilitates greater participation for all. Um, and it uses the amazing frameworks of universal design and deaf space to sort of situate the, the reader in the perspective of someone who is differently abled from them. Um, how might small changes make a significant impact in that person's environmental experience, which includes their ability to feel comfortable, to communicate, to contribute, um, mismatched interactions between man and design happen all the time and they're stressful and they happen to all of us some of the time, but they happen to some of us all of the time. And I think as designers, it's our duty to be conscious of that. Um, the last thing I'll say is that I'd like to challenge everyone, designer or not, to think about varied ability, identity, experience um, in terms of the richness and beauty and connection that every person contains. Um, I think at the core of these considerations in programming for people is seeing humans as being full of spectrums where no position is lesser or greater. Um, it's all just nuance. And I think it's really important for designers to believe that. So um, I know we're a little bit low on time, so I'll skip my images and you just have to read my chapter in the book to see how those are relevant. Thank you so much. Robin. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, thank you, Vernon, for putting this all together and inviting me to be part of this book. Thanks also to Keely and Pamela for the edits. I, this is my first foray into um, writing, and so I wasn't sure what to expect, and it was very painless, so I really appreciate you guys. Um, and thanks for everyone who's coming. I see a lot of friendly faces, or maybe I should say friendly names, on the Zoom screen. So this is my first chapter in the book. It's called Empathetic Programming to Foster Inclusion. And a little background really quickly about myself. I'm a practicing architect with over 20 years in sustainable civic architecture, and I have specialized in school design and specifically inclusive design for children with autism. Um, Vernon, I'm not sure which, what slides you have prepared. Do you have graphics for me or should I kind of just describe and speak to overall? Oh, you do. Excellent. Cool. So if, if I could um, uh, read a little bit from my chapter, I thought this was the most important uh, image to show you all. It is a sketch on a family's whiteboard calendar. And I just wanted to read from the book briefly if I could. One morning, a sketch appeared on a family's whiteboard calendar. Their 11-year-old daughter had drawn on the square for September 6th, the first day of school, a sketch of a school building with a frown face below and the words, torture starch. This sketch could be considered a fairly commonplace, metaphorical, even comical reaction to the end of summer. However, since the sketch was made by an autistic child, it signals concerns that are deeply troubling. The sketch highlights the intense feelings the sixth grader had about going to school. In particular, the sketch emphasizes a school building. This little girl could have drawn more frown faces or perhaps even a teacher with a frown face, but instead she drew a building. There was a reason for that. This sketch single-handedly inspired my research and sparked a goal to spread awareness about the significant role played by environmental design in the inclusion of children with autism. So, um, I think it really sets the tone of this chapter. I wanted to briefly summarize uh, the points of my chapter. All, peer, all people experience stress in their environments. We all know this. Uh, neurotypical children have innate coping mechanisms, which provide stress regulation throughout the school day, allowing for fruitful extended periods in an educational setting. 
However, autistic children, on the other hand, typically exhibit deficits in these coping skills, which often manifest in emotional outbursts, preventing inclusion in educational environments. My theory of empathetic design, as described in this chapter, suggests that the built environment can be a bridge. It can prevent, reduce, and relieve stress throughout the school day and thus foster inclusion for these children. But how do we design a built environment that can do this, especially when our target audience often has communication deficits and their voices are not often represented in educational environment designs? My chapter presents my theory of empathetic design, which is inspired by sketches drawn by children with autism that I have gathered over the years. I asked them to draw their dream school environments. I wanted them, uh, I wanted to give these children a voice in their decision-making process of design. So these sketches, a selection of which I have included in my chapter, provide a critical empathetic insight into the variety of programmatic relationships in school architecture, including approach, arrival, content delivery, transition, recreation, and departure. And if you could just skip, uh, skip to the previous ske uh, sketch really quickly. This was one of the student sketches of the previous one. Thank you so much. This was a student um, and he drew his ideal corridor in a school environment. He said, I would love to swim from class to class. When I'm swimming, I don't hear anything. I don't talk to anyone. I love the way the water feels and it's just fun. So obviously as a school designer, I'm not gonna fill the corridors with water, but it is telling me a lot about how I can design schools. Um, and this is just one of many sketches um, that really give us insight. And he didn't feel comfortable actually sharing that verbal description. He shared it with his mother. His mother shared it with me. So, and then the last slide is, is basically an outline of the theory of empathetic design strategies. We can design the built environment to prevent the introduction of stress, to reduce the amount of stress that is introduced, and then finally to relieve the built up stress. So that's my summary. Um, I'll be back again in a couple for my next chapter. Thanks for listening. Davis, did you want to go next? I am happy to go next. Thank you so much, Anne. Speaking of um, finding the balance in life, we have um, the, uh, the stress pushing at me that I'm, I'm going to bring my offspring down to the theater soon for rehearsal. So uh, thank you for letting me go again. I have a second chapter in the book, which is just tremendous. And I do know that this whole book sort of is a, is a focus for, my, for the students in my program because so much is relevant about what we're talking about. Um, can you all see this part one human factors? I don't see my little neon screen around it. Yep, um, we can see it. Oh, you can, okay. So now, now it disappeared. I just, I took it away for some reason, there we go. Now I can see my little neon green, Shrek green. So talking about stress, I mean, really it's resilience, right? And, and Don spoke about it eloquently both Keely and, and Robin also are focused on areas that have to do with how humans cope in the world and make sense of the world. Uh, so again, as I did for my other slides, I have just the subsection headings here so you can get an overview of what the chapter uh, discusses and goes into. Um, we, when we think about uh, finding um, the environment and how we're making sense of it, of course, environmental stressors are part of it. Um, I did not talk about epigenetics in my chapter, but that's certainly something that humans can get above and beyond their environments. Um, so the next subsection is stress and human functioning, just a very brief history of where did this word stress come from and how did it come into being diseases and definitions of that. Um, the third section is about stress and systems health. And I implore you to look at especially the, the image um, that is turned out so beautifully. I was so happy to see it in print because it always looks a bit different on the, on the draft um, by uh, Corey um, Norman, courtesy of his faculty member, uh, Nina Briggs at Cal Poly Pomona, where he, he participated in a justice skate privilege and pedagogy course and created beautiful collage imagery so the systemic, um, the systemic stress that, that falls on the many underestimated people in the world is part of my chapter and what I'm very proud of. Um, the fourth section is fundamentals of resilience. So how does one take it upon themselves to lower their um, baseline stress and how do they increase their tolerance, a window of tolerance, how we are able to better adapt and cope uh, with, 
with life. Um, through that, we move to hormesis and then community examples of this. Um, the fifth section is design applications to help promote resilience. It, it comes back to the individual and their decision making, but the environment itself can play as we all here know, I imagine. This is speaking to the choir, which is lovely, um, but how we can promote resilience through design. And then beyond that is the stress reduction beyond the individual. Um, I've included many images from student work. Uh, this is by a student. I actually have his name, his first name. I just noticed I typed it in incorrectly. I do a lot of co-authoring with Dak Kopek, uh, but this student's name is Dax, D-A-X. So just note that for the record, Dax Morton drew this image when he was in my environmental psychology class in the very beginning of the pandemic. And it just speaks to me about um, emotion and feeling and passion and how we can get a, a handle on stress. So that is a wrap for me. I'm gonna put in the chat um, how people can contact me if they would like to. And thank you all so much, Keely and Pam and Vern for getting this book happening and for everybody else that I'm getting to know and meeting and working with through this exciting work. Cheers. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. And we're on to our next one. Um, let's see, let's find this, here we go. All right, Vernon, are you doing this one? Well, if Erica's here, she's welcome to speak up. I know she was hoping to join us, uh, Laura, Warnick is unable to join us. And I, I'll mention that there've been a few questions in chat. Feel free to enter questions and we will run as long as anybody wants to stay on uh, trying to answer those. For the purposes of this chapter, applying these findings to the educational setting as Robin eloquently stated earlier is, uh, is game changing. Uh, Laura is fond of pointing out that we now know that kids work better when they move. I can recall being in grade school and being encouraged not to move. It was uh, almost breathing was uh, uh, asking too much of the environment. But uh, there's a whole new understanding of the child's learning process and needs to mature through movement and interaction that uh, Laura and Erica point out in this chapter. For the purposes of time, we'll leave it at that and to encourage everybody to read the chapter. Okay, Vernon, thank you so much. Let's... And next, Robin. That's me. Hello again, everybody. Um, I know we're running short on time, so I'll really summarize this. The inspiration for this essay, Programming for Well Certification on a University Campus, came from Catholic University, currently has three projects underway in either design or construction, um, a residence hall, a dormitory, um, and a dining common. So eat, work, and live, or whatever you want to um, talk about for that. So uh, it's a unique opportunity. So I developed a course that partnered with the Catholic University students as the user, the university architect's office as the owner, and members from all three of the design teams, the designers, in order to further the role that programming plays in the well-being of college students, staff, and faculty. The students spent the semester gathering data um, with different methodologies, primarily surveys, and then used their growing knowledge that I was teaching them with the well-building standard um, to analyze the data uh, they gathered from their peer interviews. So this chapter presents the themes that have emerged during this multidisciplinary, multi-programmatic process. Um, we also use 3M uh, VAS software to analyze the different designs from the different architecture firms. And they were wonderful to work with because my students actually proposed design interventions and reinventions to them. The campus architect suggested that the architecture teams take them in, under advisement and actually perform some of them as changes. So it was a very exciting class. The students were really engaged in the time of Zoom uh, to do all of this because they were, it was part of their own well being on their own campus environment. So very exciting. If, if that sounds good to you, that's what this chapter is about. 
Do you want to talk about this just briefly, Raman? Sure. So one of the student teams picked active design and they analyzed um, existing buildings on campus. How could we encourage people to use the stairs both inside and outside? They ran it through the VAS analysis. So as Anne had kind of talked about, um, what do people see? How can we design things differently so that they see it? If they see it, they might get a positive um, memory of it, want to go back again, want to choose to take the stair. A lot of these buildings you have to go to because you live in them or you need to eat, that kind of thing. But you know, there's always an elevator as an option. Uh, so how can we encourage people to do active design? So students studied everything from active design or lowering anxiety, ways that they can see the front entrance so they know where to walk in, that kind of thing, wayfinding. Um, so again, it's all about stress. This is a theme tonight, I think, that I'm hearing, but also active design exercise, ways to you know, um, make us healthy as individuals. So this is just an exploration that one of the student teams did that's also included in the book as a figure. Thank you. Let's see. Oh, next. I believe it's Robert. That, that's me. I'm Rob Tullis. Um, Anne, do you have um, control of these slides? I do. Uh, well, why, you, don't, why, don't you just, why don't you just advance them when okay. I tell you next slide? Sounds perfect. Um, so um, other chapters in this book, have you, as you have heard, explore how architectural programming can and should relate to the way humans experience, evaluate, and react to architecture, applying a systems thinking approach um, that Vernon talked about at the very beginning, and utilizing the insights of neuroscience, which almost every speaker has talked about. My chapter um, extends this from the functional design of the building interiors and facades to the exterior spaces that are defined and shaped by those buildings to the urban public realm. And here I explore what lessons brain research and biocentric design have for the programming of activities in city spaces and for the architectural form of the public realm. Human beings subconsciously assess our, no, stay on that one. I'll tell you when the next one comes. Okay. Thank you. Human beings subconsciously assess our intermediate environments as places of either security and support or of threats and stress. And we self-regulate to maintain a mind-body environment state of minimum stress. The effort of this self-regulation is why we don't feel comfortable in bad places, but places feel good if they have the components that incubate security, if they have the activities and forms that we subconsciously seek. And if they do, we can form an emotional bond with them. And this book's authors are all researching what makes exemplary parts of the built environment resonate with humans. In the urban public realm, this means those that can transform from space into place. And that's why my chapter is called Placemaking, Programming Urbanism for Human Engagement. Next slide, please. So my chapter is organized into three sections that roughly conform to Placemaking's three-legged stool, activity, form, and meaning. And as shown by the Venn diagram at the top of this screen, when they're all present, what we often refer to today as a sense of place can be created. I review a number of different activities, events, and uses that should be present. I separate them into unprogrammed, semi-programmed, and programmed categories. Unprogrammed activities are those that people initiate on their own if they feel comfortable. They're the vast majority, <clears throat> excuse me, they're the vast majority of activities in any public space. <clears throat> but for them to happen regularly, the characteristics of the space must resonate with human predispositions. Semi-programmed activities are those that people initiate on their own, but that require a certain facility, like a restaurant facilitates outdoor dining, for example. And programmed activities are those that require a license or special organization, like concerts in the park or Fourth of July fireworks. But I emphasize that for a place to feel vital, it's important that programmed activities span all levels of those that are shown on the programming pyramid you see here. Daily characteristics, community programs, regularly scheduled events and extravaganzas. You want people to feel that there's something always going on. You can't just have the extravaganzas, which is a mistake that a lot of programmers of public places make. And the most important thing is that designers must think of the public realm as a theater for human events. Next slide, please. 
In writing about the form of public spaces, I reference a book named Path Portal Place, and in it, Edward T. White suggests that the form of a public place can prohibit, impede, discourage, allow, promote, or support the activities there. I imagine these on the range of, of a VU type meter. As designers, we should clearly be striving towards the right end of the meter. White says that, quote, activity is created by a place when human nature meets environmental opportunity to bring about human behavior, or for the purposes of our research, when our brain body predispositions, human nature, are taken into account and they meet a sympathetic and emotionally regulating physical form, environmental opportunity, the desired theater of human events can be created, human behavior. Space then transforms into place. I discuss the composition of both the solid and the voids of our urban fabric, and I offer two methodologies for composing solids. Mannerism, in which the solids are thought of as having identities that reinforce their space shaping roles, and the armature, which you see diagrammed at the top of this slide, an arrangement of solids that's been used since ancient times to create an architecture of connection and passage that appeals to human traits. For composing the voids, I talk about the essential nature of free space versus figural space and the role of the human being in the perception of each. Next slide, please. And finally, I talk about how humans form an image of a place and attach meaning to it through a kinesthetic mind-body perceptive system that neuroscience has recently termed embodied cognition, which maintains that we're all compelled to constantly scan our immediate environment and engage with it as an informational field. We all have our favorite examples of memorable public spaces. The spatial and interpersonal information we get in them plays a fundamental role in human functionality. This feedback fulfills our need for emotional nourishment, or in the case of poorly designed spaces, it does not. The most important point is that we must think about space in order to design space. We must think of the public realm as an intrinsic part of the design program of our individual buildings, designed as thoughtfully as the buildings that form it. It's not simply the residual area left over after the buildings are done. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Need to take a breath there, but let's go on to the next person. <laughs> it was you really said three minutes. <laughs> it's beautiful. Vernon. So this is another quickie. There's a chapter in here that has almost nothing to do with programming, uh, but it's definitely got important information. If you're a member of the American Institute of Architects, they are attempting to pivot uh, the role of the architect towards uh, a sustainable future. And to that end, they've published a working paper or a white paper with this title, Disruption, Evolution, Change. And as part of their effort to change the role of the architect in terms of the performance of buildings, they're asking the profession to assume the responsibility for the development of building codes and sustainability codes in particular. So with that as a teaser, I'll uh, hope that you all read the book. And if you're architects, uh, take this on as a responsibility of the profession. Thank you, Vernon. And are you doing the next one too, Vernon? Yes, yeah, so uh, Phil Lougheed was for many years uh, a contributor to the Boston Architectural College in terms of teaching, uh, mentoring, thesis advising. He worked for many years uh, with uh, major architecture firms uh, and in his final years had his own firm and founded the Earthos Institute, which promotes the idea of one planet living. Sadly, we lost Phil after he completed this chapter and uh, the most important contribution that he has made is to uh, see the world in terms not of ecosystems uh, necessarily, but in terms of bioregions, which are slight, they're larger mm -hmm. geographical areas where human activity is naturally uh, connected with, with one another. So it can be multiple states and cities but the region has an identity that is based in part on ecology and based 
based in part on social cohesion. I uh, encourage you to not only read the chapter, but to visit the Earthos website shown here. Thank you, Vernon. And next we have Bill Reed. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Anne. And um, I haven't met any of the authors other than Vernon. And Vernon actually turned out to be more of the author of this chapter than me because of uh, uh, time commitments. And he did a much better job than I would have, I want you to know. But nonetheless, the, uh, the background is, uh, comes from our practice. And Vernon was kind enough to give me 10 minutes thinking that um, we would have time, but I don't think we do. So should I just kind of rapidly touch on? We have time. We, we're gonna, we can go another 30 minutes. We've got time. Is that right? Okay, yep. I assumed it was over at nine. Okay, well, I will try to make it less lecture-like. So let me, um, I am going to take and share my screen from this end. Uh, I hope we've got it here. Yes. Uh, should I just, I'll just leave it like this. Um, everybody can see that? Yes. Okay. So programming as a developmental, not building development, but evolutionary development um, of not only the places we live and work and the buildings we work on, but ourselves as well. So what are the opportunities to participate in the regeneration of life, all life? And that is a big ask for a building project. But in fact, it's really interesting hearing Don Ruggles speak about that, that one quote, architects have a greater ability to improve public health than the medical profession. I think that was close enough anyway to the quote. Um, we have found that real estate projects and large, even small architectural projects in communities give us the most long lasting platform to engage community in transformation than any uh, activity uh, I've been able to find out. Uh, certainly more than politics. Uh, you get lucky if you get two good years out of a politician, uh, <laughs> even NGOs, maybe six or seven years, but a large building project or a master developer in a community can actually offers transformational potential. And let me share what that's about. So not only are we working on the project right here, we are also able to work on the system that the project supports and is supported by, and even the larger system that that's nested within. So this diagram I think is fairly familiar to some of you anyway, is that I'll just be very quick about it, that the sustainability movement is still a degenerative movement. The buildings that what we do in our buildings are important and necessary to reduce the damage and make um, energy more efficient, water more potable, uh, materials less uh, disruptive, but it's still just a slower way to die. So the opposite or the counter to that is of course, working with life on its own terms. And the reason the circle is here is we need to be doing both. We need to be doing all the efficiency work and, and then we also needing to work on the effectiveness of our relationship with life. So how do we do that practically? Um, one way to frame this is uh, through a business consultant named Carol Samford who defines these this way, extract value, arrest disorder, do good and evolve inherent potential. And pretty much our, the paradigm of our world uh, for the last couple thousand years has been extract value. Take ore from the earth and nutrients from the soil, uh, spirit from employees and get some benefit out of it for those who are in charge. We realize that that's not very good place, way to live. So we arrest disorder, we slow down the damage. That's pretty much a descriptor of the sustainability movement, limiting the, limiting the damage. We know that's not enough. So we say, well, let's do good. And do good sounds really good, except when it isn't. And doing good has been, created all sorts of problems around the planet when we impose our idea of good on a living system. So whether it's the uh, AID program, the World Bank or whatever, it, we go to Africa and impose Eurocentric ideas on Africa and we know how well that works out. So doing good can be a form of colonialism unless we are paying attention to this last one, which is how do we actually participate in evolving the inherent potential of every living organism? And in this case, we use place, the places we build as a living organism. A little different than um, I'm sorry, uh, Robert, 
Tullis was talking about in place making, we're using the definition of place as every entity and energy that makes up the whole of life in a certain geographical area. So how do we work with the inherent potential? Well, let's first of all, let's define evolved innate capability a little more uh, accurately. Whether with people or life sheds, every living entity asks that we approach it individually to reveal and support its unique and inherent potential. And so what is that inherent potential? Whether it's this little girl obviously wanting to be an airplane pilot or uh, the land wanting to be recovered. This is just a photograph of Sebastian Zagato, the photographer's burnt over district in Brazil, but this is what it looks like 10 years later. Nature will act on its own in its best interest if we actually work with it and work with her on her own terms. The air in Beijing after two months of COVID, we know life wants to recover and find its uh, health and thriving interrelationships. The stream in Baltimore, Maryland, it took three years to move it from a concrete ditch to what we see here. Uh, it did not, and all we did is had to give the right acupuncture points to make that work. So the inherent potential of the places we live, whether it's Pittsburgh, Barcelona, Seattle, or Park City, Utah, uh, every place has a unique identity, no different than a child, and it's up to us to understand that and not impose our idea of good on that place to work on its own terms. And a simple example of this is an old oldie but goodie from our practice, almost 22 years now, um, but the, the Brattleboro Food Co-op in Brattleboro, Vermont, they wanted to be a lead gold grocery store. And we asked them, do you want lead or do you want sustainability? And they gave a great answer. They said they wanted both. So with that in mind, we took a look at what a grocery store does. And we also took a look at the nature of Brattleboro. And Brattleboro is a very um, a strong center in terms of the localization movement, uh, food revitalization, slow food. They have the March of the Heifers. What town has a March of, of cows? Mm -hmm. Basically reflecting on the role of the working landscape. But the average bite of food in Brattleboro uh, used to travel 20 to 50 miles. The average bite of food now travels 3,600 miles. So we asked the question, what happens if there's a trucker's strike? So they're out of business in one day. So it's not a sustainable grocery store if there's a trucker's strike or if Whole Foods comes into town, they're out of, out of business in a year. So we uh, looked around the grocery store. We found out the, uh, the first apple bin we came to, the apples were, were from New Zealand. The uh, strawberries were from California, the blueberries from Chile. So that pretty well confirms the idea that our energy uh, usage and uh, environmental footprint is significant with food. And so how do we take that back home was the question. And so the programming for this grocery store was to look at where do we, how do we grow uh, food again? Because all these green areas here are abandoned farms. The best soil, in fact, the soil is degraded. The best soil was at downtown Brattleboro. Where did most towns feed themselves during World War II? From their backyard gardens, victory gardens. So this grocery store was programmed to bring the gardens act, back activated again. And it was programmed to become an agricultural and soil extension service to teach people how to grow food again, a daycare center to take care of the kids while their parents were doing that work, a cannery to can the food, an abattoir to dress meat because it's a hunting area, um, a credit union to begin to loan money to small farmers who wanted to reestablish this, this center again, and um, a forest service extension to begin to look at how to bring back the health of these uh, soils that had been extracted from multiple multiple periods of time over the last 300 years. So when we presented that to the um, board, uh, one guy said, hey, what is this? All we wanted was a grocery store. And we learned that what we had not done is actually worked with the people and engaged them in the deep understanding that was necessary. So this whole process of engaging people and understanding themselves, understanding the potential of their relationship, their essence or inherent potential along with the inherent potential of this ecosystem needed to be combined into a whole living system. And we learned a great lesson from that. 
The point of this is, is that the project is no longer the project in this regenerative work. The project is an acupuncture point to engage new relationships. So no longer is it transactional with the community. We'll give you a swimming pool, we'll give us permission to build. We'll give you a community center. We'll pay you a certain amount of money for permission to build or offer you amenities. Instead, uh, the idea is to help everyone understand the potential for quality of life and thriving life in all dimensions in the place they live. And that way, all stakeholders, including the developer or the project, become integrated in working towards that larger system. The cool thing about this is then the, that understanding informs the nature of the project. So it's a reciprocal benefit to do that. So as the president said, we, we wrote a long report uh, as an example, uh, just because to, to recover, if you will, the damage that we had caused by imposing our idea of what we thought was good. And uh, they took, a, took them a year to embrace that. And finally, the, the, the president called up and he said, Bill, we want to apologize. This is the best thing that's ever happened to us. The building wasn't as important as we thought. It basically generated a 100 year ends policy where the community is working towards fulfilling those, that potential and those goals. So buildings, the point of this is, is buildings can be a rich source, an acupuncture point, if you will, for not only working at quality of life and benefit of health to the people in the building, but in the immediate community and the larger system that we're part of. Also, what's cool about this, I don't have the slide, is that, that not only was Brattleboro working on its local ec ecology, and food, food, it began to work with the larger cooperative network in New England and became a resource to them. So this little drop of stone, the stone dropped in the pond had multiple ripple effects. And this is how we can get massive transformation on the planet is to unleash that kind of effectiveness and relationship through the larger systems that we're part of. Buildings can have, buildings can have that powerful effect. Design then emerges from that process of understanding. I'm done, thanks. That was amazing. That was wonderful, Bill. Thank you so much. Thanks for the chance, Anne. It was great. You really condensed your, your expertise in, in about six minutes. Good to know. <laughs> you were excellent, <laughs> excellent. I guess um, next is um, Larry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, do you have my slides? Let uh, me see if I have your slides. I will see if I have your or slides. Or maybe Vernon, Vernon has them. Uh, let's see if I have your slides. I, Are they your slides? Uh, no. Those you, on. Skipped, you skipped a, a chapter. Oh, OK. Do, is, is this one, Jim Newman? No. No, it's called a, a post-pandemic. There, there you go. There, no, 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 go. Go. There, stop there. <laughs> oh, I guess Vernon threw this in, but the next slide is is um, my my first slide. Next. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> go back one, please. <laughs> thank you. Right there. Yes. Uh, I I did not plan to speak actually uh vernon uh so i i, I don't i didn't have a, a lecture or a talk planned but vernon did ask me if i want to show some images and i have four images in my chapter and they were all black and white and i thought that showing you them in color i mean or and, and hopefully you know you can download this and uh, so that when you do read my chapter, you know, they're a little bit more meaningful than the black and white images. So I will say a few words about the images. And uh, so I'm glad I didn't prepare anything because it allowed me to, in, in essence, tie my chapter to a lot of the speakers that spoke tonight. Um, so I, I, I started off talking about uh, open space as a reliever of stress based on the pandemic that we've been experiencing, that we've been seeking relief from our uh, encapsulation in our homes, you know, to go outside, get a breath of fresh air, and, and hopefully to see some life. In the beginning, there was no life on the streets. And I, I talked about that too. And eventually, as I built up the scale of open space that I talked about, 
I tied it to the pandemic, climate change, and uh, what we might look forward to in the future about how we might address this issue about uh, open space in cities and, and how we might improve climate change and uh, prevent future pandemics. So I, I, you know, I start off with, uh, and, and this first slide, which uh, talks about um, the, the Greenway and, and how my firm uh, did the original master plan in 1989 that looked at the option for Greenway much differently than what eventually happened, uh, actually is uh, follows through with uh, Robert's uh, uh, talk about uh, placemaking and, and uh, how it, uh, we, we felt that intimate squares serve a much uh, greater purpose and greater use than a, a large space as the uh, Greenway has evolved. And as I walked through, and I live nearby, and as I walked through the Greenway, even before the pandemic and during the pandemic, uh, it continues to be somewhat vacuous. Uh, and those people who you might find would be you know, children who go there on, on their outing. Well, most people actually bypass the Greenway to walk along Harbor Walk, which is just a block away. So it was a wonderful opportunity and you know, what is often called an urban lung in, in cities. Such a great space provides uh, 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 fresh air and open space to a city. But in this case, in, 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 during a pandemic, it really was not used. And uh, I, I was given the impression that I had to limit my slides, but in my chapter, I did compare this to Com Ave, which is much greatly uh, more successful when I walked down Com Ave during the pandemic uh, than the Greenway. Um, and this led to a discussion about streets. Next slide, please. Um, this is another one of our projects, which we want an international competition and then redesign the uh, Bun, the uh, waterfront, a one mile uh, the length of the of the waterfront in Shanghai, uh, which doubled the width of the, uh, uh, what is it called? Levee <laughs> along the river um, to, to make, because there, it was their little big dig where they uh, have the highway uh, along the uh, waterfront, uh, put it on the ground and gave the, uh, uh, six lanes to make this uh, park wider, which was much more successful and used than say, the, again, referring back to the Greenway, which is an open space, which is uh, bracketed by busy roads, right? as opposed to uh, marrying it to one side and making it much more useful and uh, uh, giving a chance to line it with uh, commercial space. Um, uh, and this led to, next slide, please, how, uh, many cities think about how they can get open space or expand. And in this case, on the upper left quadrant is how a, a city in Shanghai wanted to double their city, which was currently north of the river. And they just wanted to just grow across the river and double in size. And we suggested that uh, given how much space they have, land they have, and how much they want to grow, um, which was like three and a half million uh, people, we suggested that they concentrate the development in uh, sort of five Manhattan sized fingers so that the space between these fingers are preserved agricultural land uh, and open space, which uh, again is sort of linked to a lot of what other people have talked about in terms of uh, um, uh, sort of bioregional thinking, bioregional planning, and certainly sustainability. So this was uh, our recommendation of not uh, doing what lots of uh, countries have done around the world uh, in terms of how they spread out and they just get a, a bigger and bigger footprint uh, around their original cities, as opposed to thinking of it more uh, in fingers, but, it, uh, but with including uh, transportation so that you minimize uh, this use of cars to 
and highway uh, construction to go into the city. And this led to a last scale, next slide please, uh, in our planning of a new city in uh, Malaysia, a 25 year mass plan of uh, 43 square miles, which is slightly smaller than the city of Boston and uh, a bound, uh, it was not, not contiguous. And um, we suggested that we preserve about 50% of the land as open space, concentrate the development along the transit corridors that we suggested. Um, and sort of revitalize and strengthen the forest, which you can see this great uh, permanent forest that's north of uh, uh, the, the, the uh, planned city. Um, and sort of revitalize our Pyrrhon corridors and uh, uh, create a, what we call a mountain to the sea green corridor, a 30 mile uh, greenway network that goes from the mountain all the way to the streets of Malacca on the lower left hand corner. Um, uh, and a lot of the practices that we recommended included not what was being planned, normally planned in a country like Malaysia, where if they see a mountain, they would cut it down. If they see a river valley, they would fill it up with what they cut down and just make everything flat. And uh, we were very sensitive and recommended uh, that uh, they respect the land more and in fact reinforce it and and plan the city around these uh, topographical features instead of you know, making a uniform grid out of it. So this was approved and signed by the prime minister in short time and uh, except for the pandemic and the economic conditions, uh, this is sort of like put on hold for a moment. Um, so, uh, so that's essentially, uh, and, and this was kind of timely um, uh, given the pandemic today, because a lot of the research and, and findings and reports have said that uh, uh, the um, coronavirus uh, source comes from infected bats. And these bats are uh, were in areas uh, uh, or are in areas in caves where um, they've been uh, uh, flying and, and breathing um, without anyone disturbing them. But as habitats encroach upon these natural areas and, and cutting down forests, uh, there's great exposure and incidence of zoonotic uh, infections uh, because of this uh, transferring of viruses from bats to animals and animals to people and or bats directly to people, et cetera. So uh, the, the the, towards the end of the book, and I, which, I, which you know, I'm, I'm giving a very, very short synopsis of, uh, I tied the sort of uh, need and preservation of open space to uh, suggestions of where we sort of limit or even pull back uh, urban habitats, uh, preservation enhancement of uh, natural areas. And that ties, of course, uh, linked to climate change. Now, now, uh, uh, I wanted to um, reiterate Don and Robin and many other speakers about thanking Vernon to uh, inviting me about a year ago to contribute to this uh, uh, book. And like Robin, it has been my sort of first venture in actually writing something as opposed to drawing something or designing something um, and uh, assembling you know, this wonderful group and. Uh, chapters that I sort of read through quite quickly. I probably will go back and read them in more detail. Um, but it's been about a year now uh, since we wrote the book. And it's about two years since uh, the pandemic has happened. And I suggest that, and, and lots of changes happened, but then a lot of things have not changed. Yes, we got uh, vaccines and about 60% a little less, 60% 60, 60 are, are, are vaccinated. Um, but that's only in the United States. In Africa, it's less than 10%. It's like 6% of people in Africa, uh, entire Africa is vaccinated. And it's, it's uh, stated that we need 90% vaccination uh, before we have herd uh, immunity. So at this rate, given the uh, example of uh, Omicron, and maybe next we'll have you know 
a, a, a psi and, and omega, you know, whatever. We might go through the entire Greek alphabet at this at this rate. Um, suggests that perhaps this book is just volume one because it nicely states, right? Uh, so the standards, things that we should think about, things that we should uh, uh, um, implement. But uh, at this rate where Pat, the uh, coronavirus would be with us forever and climate change is getting worse, not better, that these two conditions may actually change our standards, our regulations, our programmatic elements, right? And at some point we might have to recalibrate how we think about space, how we use space, how we gather, how we see things. Now there are about 84 million people who are refugees around the world. And there are about 689 million people living in poverty. Those people, when they walk down the streets, they're not looking at cars. They're not looking at uh, people walking. They're looking at uh, uh, demolished homes. They're looking at drought conditions. They're looking at uh, uh, places where if there's no shelter, there's no food. Right? Their value system is greatly different than what, what we have been writing about. So I'm suggesting that volume two may uh, gather us and others to address these issues that apply to others. Now I'm looking at all the participants here and there's a very small minority of people of color, all right? And people of color may look at things very differently and have different standards of what we've been talking about. A black man walking down the streets, when he looks at a car, right, he's one to wonder whether or not he's gonna be shot or whether or not he's gonna be pulled over, right? And that's in the United States. So our issues are not just address, we need to address the people uh, who are refugees or immigrants or who are poor in other countries, we have to actually look at even here in the United States where people have been living in red line communities or in underserved communities. Uh, so I think that's sort of perhaps our second volume, right? Uh, how we can implement the ideas that we have to address not, new, not just new construction, but existing neighborhoods, existing buildings, some of which in our inner cities are about 200 years old. And it's much, much harder to make those buildings green, to make those buildings sustainable than it is with the relatively smaller amount of new buildings, right? Uh, so, and then perhaps looking further forward, there might be a third volume based on the perhaps permanent changes that we uh, might have to address and experience and recalibrate our uh, value system. Think about what the future might look like because we have to make, perhaps be forced to make that transition from what we think we, we like and what we know today, what we need to address that hasn't been addressed and how that might look like in some future time. So Vernon, gather together everyone to write your next two books and perhaps even more. Thank you very much. Larry, happy to work on that proposal with you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Larry. Thank and you. We missed a chapter. We need to go back. Okay. Okay. Where? It's prior to this. There you go. Okay. Uh, Jim, are you still with us? No, Jim left. Oh, okay. All right. So I'll just say a brief word for uh, these folks, all of whom were at the time at Linnaean Solutions, Jim Newman's firm, uh, did a stand up job on issues like uh, resilience and um, surviving, you know, under extreme conditions, uh, really, you know, solid uh, 
well-grounded information that I encourage everyone to read. And I'm sorry, I, I don't believe Eleanor or John are on. Uh, they've since moved on, but uh, thank them all for their contribution. And we can move ahead to the final concluding chapter is plural. And this is a chapter where I summarize the evidence-based design approach and emphasize the uh, commissioning dimension of, of that process. So on the one hand, you state the goals through the programming process, then you have to make sure that they are in fact met. And uh, that is what Dr. Horsberg will conclude with in the final chapter, if you are with us, Robert. Oh no, uh, I'm, yes, I, I'm still here, Vernon. I think yeah. I, I don't think that really I should be the uh, closing chapter, but at any rate, I'm a professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at Boston University. And my chapter is really a methods chapter about how epidemiologic analysis and statistical uh, methods can be used to examine the relationship between the built environment and health outcomes. And I go through a, sort of a basic primer of how you set these studies up. And then I do uh, refer to a number of examples, the most famous of which I think probably everyone is familiar with. And it's a study 50 years ago by Roger Ulrich and his uh, colleagues in which they showed that patients who got randomly assigned to a post-op room that had a view of a brick wall uh, ended up staying in the hospital longer and using more pain meds than people who got assigned uh, to a post-op room that had a view of a park and trees. And that really kicked off the whole area of using this technique to examine uh, the effect of the built environment on people and on their health outcomes. And so it's, it's a very valuable technique, uh, but uh, it's, it's a bit dry, so I'm not gonna go into great detail, just to say that uh, it, it's a very powerful technique that I think is underused. And I hope that uh, uh, this book, which I'm very happy to be part of, will contribute to more use of these techniques to tease out some of the important relationships between the built environment and the health of people who, who live in them. Thank you, Robert. And um, I'm really glad that you're teaching this as well. The idea that you're getting uh, public health students to understand this is very encouraging. So there was a chapter that we missed by Gregory Crawford who writes about uh, Christopher Alexander. And uh, that also is an excellent chapter which Gregory being in Portugal was unable to join us and describe I think we can go to the concluding slide and then if there's a conversation that anybody would like to uh, share that that's helpful. But if you do choose to purchase the book, I encourage you to get it from the publisher because you get a 20% discount. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that Amazon is uh, sold out of their paperback copies. Uh, I have it on good authority that the last copy was purchased today. Um, I'm sure they'll be ordering more, but why pay more? Go to Rutledge, use the discount code. And who wants to tackle the chat? Anybody? We still have 17 people here. In any case, maybe this is a good time to say thank you all uh, for being here this evening and uh, for being part of this project. And uh, Larry, we're definitely going to take you up on continuing this work. Yeah. And I think, I think it's great. Just the diversity of the people you brought together. I thought it was just fantastic, Vernon. There's just so much interest in how we make a better, more sustainable world that uh, where we understand our biology and our ecosystem in a way that just people didn't think that way in the 20th century. So it's just game changing. And seeing all your faces here is just wonderful. Uh, it's just great. Good job, Vernon and Keely. <laughs> yep, and I hope the book sells like hotcakes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Well, we're counting on you to require it of all your students. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Night, Thank everyone. you. Yeah. Take care.